you know, buckle on your spurs. We're going to keep going here. Um, so with this one, I'm going to talk about a little more advanced stuff. And um, generally, um, I have at least an hour to an hour and a half talking about this. And uh, of course, I don't have this kind of time uh, here, but um, there are, I've got a number of publications out there that talk about most of the stuff that I have here. Um, okay, so for today, we're going to do a little bit of what's context for bioengineering and appreciating riparian zones and what are functions, some of the principles, some technique, thoughts, and some closing uh, answers, questions and answers. So first, some context. There are a number of things to consider about riparian areas and that you need to make sure that you keep in mind. This first one is um, all channels change over time and streams are always changing. And with bioengineering, we're working with the dynamic nature of the stream uh, and rather than trying to dictate its structure and function uh, with restoration work. Um, here we're looking at the way a stream changed after the installation of some beaver dam analogs here. And that just shows you that you can jump spot and augment the natural processes rather than uh, forcing specific changes. Another thing to consider is that with established systems, uh, periodic bank erosion will occur. I mean, that's just the nature of rivers. And one thing that you'll notice here is this looks pretty bad. I mean, it eroded into this bank, but because the riparian zone was well vegetated, you have a variety of herbaceous and woody and shrubby material, it will stop, it'll slow down that erosion so it doesn't go as far. Um, so it's a, it's a good thing to remember that uh, planting that riparian zone and making sure it's well vegetated will save you a lot of heartache in the long run. Some more things, uh, treatments, uh, bioengineering treatments are, are not as static as some traditional engineered bank stru stabilization structures uh, or projects. This is uh, the uh, concrete chute that the Colfax River is in, uh, in Colfax, Washington. And uh, uh, we have this, there are a lot of these all over the country, uh, especially down in California and Texas. And, and uh, we even have them in Idaho here. So. Um, and what they did, of course, is they put the stream into this concrete chute to protect houses on both sides or uh, manufacturing areas or anything that, that uh, um, you know, we don't want to get washed away. And so they build this chute and they wind it around through town. And then at the other end is where the problem occurs. And because this thing has no way to reduce energy, it can't reduce its velocity. Uh, there's no roughness, there's nothing. And so it, it goes through at full speed ahead. And when it comes out the other end, it's like a shotgun. And it's just this blast of pellets that go out. And if you haven't done a good job protecting the end of this thing, you're gonna have huge erosion problems. So uh, bioengineering treatments uh, will help us to kind of prevent this kind of problem. Um, rather than like staying the same, bioengineering treatments are more dynamic and they tend to evolve with the stream system. This is a, a, an example. This is called the Winooski River Project in Vermont. This was 1939. And this was before bioengineering really got a heads up, at least in the United States. And uh, this is a huge, um, can, uh, draw canyon uh, thing that uh, went up and it was uh, a lot of dairies and it had a number of, of uh, big storms that went down and wiped out the stream system, wiped out a bunch of dairies, the, the damage was in the hundreds of millions of dollars and there were a bunch of engineered projects down there and the uh, 
the farmers decided, okay, we're not going to go this way again. We're going to try this. And so uh, the NRCS then designed a, a treatment system with bioengineering, and they went from this and then this is uh, the first year when the after the plants were planted. Notice this where the where the road is right here, and then that's where this is. This is the road here, and then this is all the, the from that uh, planting back in the 1939, 40, and 41. So it's a way for us to uh, have a dynamic system, and it goes back to that one I showed you before, where if it erodes in the bank, at least you have the uh, material, the, the uh, plants, uh, to be able to slow it down and keep it from going very far. Um, and this one, uh, there are a number of uh, treatments that evolve with the um, system. And uh, with this one, you can kind of see this is what it looked like in 2016, and then 2016, and then 2018. These are the beaver dam analogs. And then this is what it looks like in, in 2020. So it literally evolved with the system. This forced it to get a few more meanders. Remember, meanders are the um, are the sort of the brakes of the system. It, it allows it to slow the water down and keep it from uh, building up too much velocity. And then in this one, this is where they uh, did some planting along here with with a little bit of um, uh, mulch. And, and then uh, they started planting uh, more willows and, and uh, shrubs, et cetera, in this area. Some more things to consider is that they're often not a permanent fix, um, you know, and, and there's been some studies that uh, compared hard structures to bioengineering bio structures. And when a hard structure goes out, when, it, when it's uh, damaged and, and, uh, or broken, um, it costs just about as much to fix it. With a bioengineering treatment, that's usually not the case. But in here, what you can see is they had a whole bunch of treatments down here at a much higher flood event, and they didn't protect this upper part. And this is all coir fabric that is underneath everything else. It's just kind of hanging down in the water and all the other treatments that were down here, willows and plantings and all that stuff, were all wiped out. Uh, in this one, this is a vertical bundle that it was laying vertically up the bank and um, it got hit with a pretty good, pretty good water flow and it actually broke these uh, stakes, these dead stout stakes, and then uh, it actually moved it downstream a little bit. And the big thing I want to point in here is this hole right here. What happened is the water went over the top and then it hit on the other side and then started scouring. And generally it'll scour right back underneath it. So in terms of protecting the bank, this didn't do the job it was supposed to do. Another one, this is, you know, what the intent with these bioengineering treatments is to support and restore the natural processes. And in this one uh, up here, this is, uh, again, this is a, this Trout Creek, which is up in Northern Nevada, uh, grazed very heavily uh, from the early 1800s. And uh, not, there's no willows in there left. And uh, it's just uh, pounded down in, uh, every year with grazing. So, um, we were able to get a, a change in management and some riparian pastures established. And then we went in and planted it. And this is eight years later. And you can see the sedges have come back in. We have a whole bunch of willows and cottonwoods growing along the bank. So what we're trying to do is restore those natural processes that protect it. Some more things to consider is the growth and development of the riparian buffer is critical. And that usually requires maintenance at some point. Uh, this happens to be in California. And uh, what you'll see here is that this broke loose right here. It was attached right here. And so if you were to go in right now and move this back and attach it here, you could protect this whole treatment. If you leave this out, there's a good chance that it'll break loose and lose this entire bottom part. So more. Um, Sort of maintenance is in California, this is an irrigation line and they had to use that for the trees that are in these uh, guards. And um, 
some of the tree, uh, the maintenance here is required was that this got knocked down when this opened up. And so uh, going back in and fixing this will help protect that tree. Um, there are several more that are down up here. You've missed some here that are that have uh, flowed, uh, that were washed away, et cetera. So, and this one is a, a beaver dam uh, analog and had to go in and actually build up uh, the stems and, and branches and trees that they put on the inside of this to keep it from uh, uh, having too much water go through and causing more erosion. So soil buyer engineering treatments rely on a number of things. First is the deposition of sediment. Sediment being able to allow sediment to be deposited on the plants will get you better success. And the way you do that is by having to slow the water down. And um, as you slow the water down, then that allows, it can't carry as much sediment, so the sediment drops out. So in this case, this is a brush mattress with a uh, fascine at the bottom. And then they used a little bit of uh, rock on the outside of that. And then uh, this, is, uh, this is about five years later. And uh, so what we wanna do is uh, we're gonna rely on uh, a number of grasses, riparian grasses, some wetland plants, sedges and, and uh, um, the uh, juncus or rushes and uh, uh, spike rushes, et cetera, uh, and flowering plants uh, that have a huge hair-like uh, root system. And that's going to give us the basis of strength in the bank to keep it from uh, eroding. And then we're going to plant trees and shrubs that will develop larger and deeper root growth. Sometimes we're, we might have to add some inert material. That's what we, we did here where we put in, in a little bit of rock at the base, uh, even though a lot of times the only thing that would be left there is the fascine. But you can kind of, you can see that the growth uh, was pretty good and it, and it was able to protect that bank. Um, another thing is uh, that if you have a moderate storm occur before the vegetation is established, um, fire engineering structures may not be firmly anchored enough. And um, you're gonna have a high poten potential for significant additional bank erosion. So this is one where they did, uh, they have a weir here and um, they went in and they did a whole bunch of plantings. You can kind of see the cuttings in here. And what they didn't plan on was this right here is a coir log that was upstream. It broke loose because they didn't anchor it well enough. It floated down and went right into this uh, low spot where the water was supposed to go through. So it plugged it up and it forced the water to go around and, and out through these holes here. And so these uh, cuttings didn't have a, a chance to really grow. So it's causing a lot more erosion. Again, maintenance here and making sure that when you establish it, you, you make sure that you use good techniques to keep it there. Um, unanticipated changes can result in unanticipated or unexpected success. Uh, in this particular one, uh, this was a beaver dam analog. Um, the water was supposed to go through here. And what happened was it got, it grew up so well and so, so thick that it forced the water to go out and around and actually gave us a little extra um, sinuosity and meandered there. One thing that I, I always like to point out here is that you want to go with an interdisciplinary uh, team approach. And you're going to have a lot of people on this team. And the number one, very first person to put on that team is the landowner. The landowner is the one that's going to make sure they have a lot of effort and a lot of hope invested in the project. And so you want to make sure they're there from the start. Engineers, hydrologists, soil scientists, biologists, plant people, other professionals, you want them there to be able to help when you're putting together the plan. You'll be a lot more successful if you do that. Always the note. You got to make sure that you obtain all the permits before you begin construction, before you step in the stream, make sure that you have your permits. Um, 
permits aren't usually required for a lot of planting. That really depends on the state. It depends on sometimes county and of course the core and just making sure that they are aware that you're gonna go in and do planting. Nothing makes them angrier than getting a phone call from a concerned neighbor who says, you're out there destroying the stream. If they know that you're there, they can explain, no, you're actually planting. If they don't know you're there, then they get their butt chewed and they are not happy. So it's always a good idea just to touch base with your permitting agencies and make sure that they understand what you're doing, what you're planning to do, and make sure that uh, if there are um, state or local permits that, that you get those too. So I wanna talk a little bit, uh, there are a lot of um, restoration uh, uh, people out there who, practitioners who have done this work and you understand riparian zones, but there's a lot of new people that that may not really understand riparian zones. So I want to sort of get us all starting off on the same foot. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what a riparian zone is. Riparian zones are areas between aquatic and upland habitats. They're usually long linear lines along the streams and rivers that are occasionally flooded by those bodies of water. Um, when you look at the definition of, of a riparian zone, it may be dry for, uh, for portions of the growing season. That's, that's pretty natural. Uh, it has saturated soil conditions and it has vegetation that requires free and unbound water conditions. So the, the definition that I use is where water saturates the soil more than the adjacent areas and water loving vegetation is concentrated. That's how we define a riparian system. So let's talk about functions, some riparian zone functions. Um, first, it provides erosion control by regulating sediment transport and distribution. This is a big one. Sediment transport is huge with stream systems. And when you put in a bunch of treatments that block sediment transport, you're going to lose it. It will blow out. And because the sediment has to go someplace, if you block it, it drops out, it builds up, and then it forces the water to go around it. So sediment transport is really important if you don't understand how streams move sediment and where the sediment comes from, then you really need to talk to uh, a hydrologist. Uh, and, and understand, get a really good understanding of what uh, sediment transport is. It enhances water quality. I talked about this before. The microbial populations in the root systems will break down like uh, uh, the phosphorus and, and into uh, phosphates and into uh, elemental phosphorus that is used by the plants uh, from nitrates to nitrites, et cetera, et cetera. So the, so the uh, Vegetation or the uh, microbial populations and the vegetation will do all that. Uh, produces organic matter for, for aquatic habitats. Basically, this is fish food. And it provides um, wildlife habitat, as most everybody knows, I think. Um, they're indicators of environmental change. Uh, I like to sort of compare them to this, which is the canaries in the coal mine. And when you had people that were, um, working in the coal mines, what they would do is they would take a canary in a cage and they would go down underground with the canary. And the smart guys, while they were working in the coal mine down underneath, they would keep one eye on the canary because when the canary started drooping or falling down at the bottom of the cage, they, they knew that they only had minutes to live. And so they were uh, getting out of the mine as fast as they possibly could. But so just gave us an indicator. They're sensitive to a wide variety of variations in the environment in the hydrologic cycle, so it gives us a better heads up. And they're some of the most diverse, dynamic, and complex biological systems on Earth. Um, talked a little bit about uh, zones, and I want to go back into these a little bit more and. Each zone is a little bit different consideration and treatment options. And the big point I want to make is that we use the zones to help us determine what and where to plant. And these zones all have different um, 
water. It has, uh, with here, you can kind of see the average water elevation, bank full water elevation, over, over bank elevation, flood prone elevation. All those things will give you an idea of how the stream works and where the water goes. So here is the tow zone. And the tow zone um, is the uh, elevation between the bed and the average water elevation. This is your zone of highest stress. This is the one that can make or break your entire project. Um, it is where you're going to, if, you, if it gets to eroding on the tow zone, all the stuff that you've done on the bank zone and maybe the overbank zone can be lost because it will under -erode, under, undercut it and drop it in and send it downstream. Uh, it can be undercut by these currents uh, below the average water elevation. Uh, they're inundated for significantly longer than six months out of the year. So uh, you can't really plant woody species in there. Generally, what we have to do is use um, wetland plants. I use uh, bulrush, uh, sometimes cattails. Um, spike rush is another one that is good for that. And plant those in large clumps that you're planting on the bank. Um, you can put the vertical bundles in that and because they're actually getting water, but the growth is above that on the bank zone. Um, so that's the tow zone. Second one is, um, this is the bank zone. So it's the, with the average water elevation to the bankful discharge elevation. And you can kind of see that uh, right here. Uh, it's exposed to, uh, Erosive river currents, wind generated waves, uh, ice and debris, freeze thaw, wet dry, all those things can affect the plants that you put on there. So it's a tough place to plant. You want to make sure that you protect the plant. It's inundated, luckily, for less than six months out of the year, so we can plant the willows in there. And the willows that you plant, you want to make sure that they're short, shrubby willows with flexible stems that lay down as the water goes over and come back up. Um, you don't want to plant your large shrubs and trees. Those will be at the upper end of the overbank and into the transition and up into the upland. The overbank zone or the floodplain is the zone between the bankful discharge elevation and the overbank elevation down here. And <clears throat> it's occasionally exposed to erosive water currents, ice and debris, freeze thaw, some wind generated waves on during spring runoff, et cetera. Um, the water spreads out here. It's kind of like a flooded pasture. So the plants in this zone, uh, generally you want to be at least have some inundation tolerance. Uh, again, these are flexible stem willows in here. Uh, dogwoods would work here. Um, you just don't want uh, willow species that are um, either single stem, large single stem, or multiple large stems. Um, alder birch and other large species, again, if you're looking to plant those, you can start planting those at the upper end of this zone. Um, the transitional zone, again, zone between water and no water. Uh, it's between the overbank elevation and the flood prone uh, elevation. Um, this zone is uh, where your riparian plant species uh, are going to transition. Usually it's not subject to a lot of erosive water currents except during very high water events. This is where you start your trees and, and uh, plants don't necessarily have to be extremely flood or inundation tolerant. It depends on sort of your planting method and how deep the water table is. Uh, the upland zone, again, this is above the uh, uh, flood prone elevation. Here, erosion is going to be more overland water flow, so it's coming from up here down over it and down into the stream. Uh, wind erosion, um, and of course, the big one is the elimination of the riparian buffers from improper farm farming practices, overgrazing, improper uh, timber harvest, uh, development. All those things, and so there's a there's a lot of uh, potential to work with the different landowners or land users uh, to make sure that they're uh, doing things on proper method that keep the water from eroding over that area down into the stream. 
So here, the plants that you're going to use are going to be uh, drought tolerant. So now let's move into some principles of bioengineering. So this is the definition that I use. Uh, stream bank soil bioengineering is defined as the use of live and dead plant materials in combination with natural and synthetic support materials for slope stabilization, erosion reduction, and vegetation establishment. This one, even though it's 1997, it has been used extensively throughout a lot of the literature. And uh, a lot of people have taken this and sort of reworded it a little bit. But this one says pretty much everything you need to know about bioengineering. A um, couple things to remember uh, and why they include some inert material in the definition is that roots only go so deep. And you're trying to get plants and species that will go as deep as you can get them. But again, that is only so deep. So sometimes you may need to use inert material, whether it's rock, it could be uh, timber, it could be a lot of different things. Uh, uh, there are a lot of um, different manufacturers that make things that, that you could use too. Um, and, and what we typically will find is that uh, you're going to, in this situation, especially where you have a failure like this, a deep failure, where you're going to need um, bio and some inert material. Um, remember that with stream bank bioengineering, that it uses plants as the main structural component to stabilize and reduce erosion on stream banks rather than just for aesthetics. So plants are the key structural component. And if you don't get the successful establishment of those plants, then typically you're not going to be successful with protecting the bank. So there are a lot of advantages to stream bank bioengineering. And uh, you can read through this list, uh, the aesthetics, it, it, uh, it's easier to, to, excuse me, to transition to an end, which means you're going from a treatment to no treatment. And it's easier to, to come out of that, like we talked about with the uh, concrete trough. When it hits the end, you got to be able to transition into the stream again, unless you're going to do the whole stream in, in concrete like uh, California does. So um, it has a lot of habitat value. It's very cost effective. It's self-healing. So if you get a lot of erosion into it, the plants will regrow again using the right plants. Uh, you can use natural materials. This is a good one for a lot of landowners and volunteers because you don't need hundreds of thousands of dollars and hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of equipment and rocks and all kinds of stuff that you would typically have with um, an engineered structure. So you'll typically have minimal site disturbance here and there are more advantages to some of the disadvantages. Um, of course, the big one is fail and failure to grow. If you don't plant right and the plants don't grow, then you're missing your main structural component. They can be uprooted by freezing and thawing. I've actually seen plants thrown out of the ground um, by freezing and thawing. Uh, and that took me back walking up and seeing these plants on top of the ground uh, after we spent all uh, last fall planting them and then coming to find out they were all uh, popped out of the ground by freezing and thawing. Uh, they can be damaged by ice and debris, fall, uh, you know, deposit on top of them, uh, or sometimes when when you the ice will and the debris will go across your plantings and it'll scrape the bark off of them. I've actually seen that happen in Oregon, and and uh, but eventually the the stems usually will come back up again. Those that haven't been popped off, but they'll come back up again and they'll start regrowing and they'll uh, they'll be able to handle that. Um, wildlife and livestock feed on it. Uh, remember when they grab a hold of it and start pulling it up, if you don't have it deep enough or you don't have it packed well enough, um, there's a good chance that uh, the livestock or, or uh, elk will pull it up. Uh, remember maintenance is extremely important, but it, it means going back to the site. Usually they don't uh, fund maintenance either. So uh, you got to think about that. Um, plus there are a whole bunch of other issues too. Okay, so now I want to kind of go into some thoughts. And um, 
one of the big ones is um, that that if you think about it, what's the most expensive part of planting a plant? Most expensive part usually is digging the hole. And uh, so if you dig a hole or if one is dug for you by the engineers, plant a pole. So in this in this situation here, are the um, uh, bank logs where they, uh, here's the bank here, and they put these in and then covered them up. And what we did is we went in and put cuttings all the way along the sides on both sides because the engineers had already dug it down to, into the water for us. So we just stuck the poles in along the edge. This happens to be a um, root wad with the root wad down at this end. And here's the base of it. And we just went down and lined the whole thing with, with, with cuttings. And, and then we had them fill it back in again. And this is really neat because you can put different species in here. You can put wetter species at this end and drier species or even trees and cottonwoods at this end. And so it's, and the beauty of it is, is that the hole is already dug for you. Um, here's, here's that same, the, the, the bank logs here. And then you can see this is where the willows are, where we put the cuttings all the way around it. And so it's a it's a pretty easy way. All you have to do is make sure that you have the cuttings there when they are filling the hole back in again. Another one is putting more than one cutting in a hole. Um, if the cutting grows, uh, you've paid for the paid for the hole. Uh, you know, if one of them grows, if all of them grow, Merry Christmas. So uh, this is one that I've started moving to, especially if you're using small diameter cuttings. Their cuttings need to be about three quarters of an inch is what uh, in diameter is what my um, idea is. And uh, um, if you can't get that, uh, Drummond is one of those that's very difficult to get in that size, then you might consider um, putting several cuttings in that same hole. And it works really well. Always muddy in the cuttings and the containerized plants and your clumps to get rid of any air pockets. What I do is I use a five gallon bucket like this and I mix it with um, soil sort of to the consistency of cheap syrup. And then I pour that in around the cutting. And then you put more soil in. And it's just like if you take uh, soil, put it in a jar, put water in it, you shake it up and then you let it sit it will eventually settle down to the bottom. And when it settles down to the bottom, you have perfect soil to stem contact that way. The other thing is that it will help you hold the cutting there. The easiest way to tell that if you've done your plantings right is to go grab a hold of the top of this cutting and try and pull it out. If it comes out, you know you haven't done it right. If, it, if you can't get it out of the ground, you know it's perfect. So. Um, these are clumps, and so when we put the clumps in, we go ahead and put water from the bucket uh, right in on top of them, and and that will settle the soil around them, get the roots, the soil in around the roots of the clumps, and uh, get, make sure that it has that soil uh, to stem contact to make sure it grows well. Some more thoughts. Um, to get a cutting to root and grow, you have to have good soil to stem contact. And that is just, just the key. And if you keep that in mind when you're picking whatever you're doing to, to dig the hole or whatever you're doing to plant with or the people you're having uh, help you plant, make sure they understand that concept and what it is and why it's important. You know, got to make sure that the cuttings are 10 to 12 inches into the lowest water table of the year. Remember, that's the number one cause of failure that I've found. Cuttings or clump source uh, is um, critical for uh, establishment. And what that means is that um, Hang on while I do a little bit of uh... So um, what I'm talking about here is the vigor of the uh, plant cutting. And what that means is that um, 
you um, want to make sure that you don't harvest from an area that is um, and have a lot of water. Uh, the cuttings have been dry for a long period of time. I, I was working in a on one project and um, I had a um, um, I had a refuge that offered me some cuttings. We'd go out and use their willows to. Um, uh, cut the willows and, and take them to our uh, planting site. And I walked out there and here are these clumps and there was no water. And I said, uh, where's the water? And he said, oh, about two or three miles that way. And I went, uh, and how long has the water been out? Oh, it's been a year or two, you know, because it was more of a drought at the time. That's when you need to think really hard about whether you really want to harvest the effort into harvesting the plants for that. Um, so uh, just just something to be aware of and that you want to make sure that you are um, getting the right, um, you're getting plants that are uh, um, vigorous and they have a lot of um, hydration and they haven't been dry too long, et cetera, et cetera. So one of the best places you can get cuttings is or clumps is from a nursery, but you have to work with the nursery to make sure they understand um, some of your criteria that you have for the plants, how long you want the uh, the uh, the stems to be, uh, etc. When you are planting clumps, um, you want to plant it so that one quarter of the root mass is in the lowest water table. Here you can see dug down to where the water table is here. And then when we put the clump in, so about a quarter of that root mass in the bottom of it is in the water. And then three quarters of it is above the water, but it's in saturated soil. So then they pull the soil back in and water it uh, extensively. There, I have a couple of uh, publications on how to use uh, plant clumps, and I'll show you that at the end of the presentation. All right, then, so here I want to make a, a big point on monitoring and maintenance. Um, again, this is one that is is just is just most people don't pay attention to it, but monitoring tends to stimulate your maintenance. It lets you understand when you need to do maintenance, if you're doing enough maintenance, and if you do need to do more maintenance. It also may uh, help you to determine if the process of planting that you're going through is adequate. It may not be, and you may have to make some adjustments. It identifies your failures and developing problems before they get to be major ones. It, it dictates the need for regular maintenance. It also dictates the need to change your management practices. Management usually is either grazing or it could be farming, that kind of thing. And remember I said management changes are the cheapest and easiest ways to go. And if you planted, you also need to make sure that you're protecting plants that you put in there. So it also uh, monitoring ensures your targeted functions are being addressed. So when you put together your objectives and you're trying to figure out what I want to do, then you put your plan together, then you plant, this will help you make sure that everything is going uh, the way you wanted it to go. Some problems associated with m and is, is um, you don't take it into account in, in the planning process. This is one that I see over and over and over again. The second is you don't put any costs into it. Part of the problem with this is that agencies will not fund monitoring and maintenance. You have to come up with that on your own. So uh, that makes it uh, a little harder. Uh, make sure that your annual plan of operation uh, has time allocated for monitoring and maintenance. and and uh, I'd, I'd say 90% of them don't, they just don't include it at all. Um, the other thing that I find that's really important is that you, that you have a um, responsible party by name, you want their name attached to it and they're gonna carry out m, &M. not, oh yeah, somebody will do it. No, I wanna know the name of the person that's gonna do it. 
And then you want to make sure that they that the managers have put time in that person's annual work plan to complete the M and M because he's not going to do it if um, you know if there's no time in his budget if he's got everything else to do and and they haven't allowed time for him to go in and do one or anything. So that's about it. This is one of my favorite uh, uh, cartoons and. It's, you know, it's time we face reality. My friends, we're not exactly rocket science scientists. And that's the way it is working on the river is that there's no cookbook out there. There's no um, whole bunch of specs out there that, that will tell you this is what you do in this situation. You have to design each planting plan according to the inventory that you found, the plants, the water, understanding all that things will give you a good plan. But you can't go to page 12 and say, oh, I'll just do this. It just doesn't work that way. So are there any questions? So I know that was a lot and it's, remember I, I teach a two day, three day course on this. So it's a, so there's a lot of information I was trying to get in there that would help you at least hunger for a little bit more. So um, uh, I hope that you learn something from this and I hope that you can apply it in your future work. So I would ask if there are any questions and Jan, hello, where are you? Yeah, Chris, I'm here. I was just um, oh, waiting yeah. to see if, if Ryan or Drew wanted to pop in and, and um, do this question uh, session here. And if they had any questions themselves or things to add, Ryan or Drew, are you guys there? I must have scared them off. <laughs> There's somebody in the background. Oh, uh, Drew, it's it's hard to hear you. Hear me now? Am I there? Yeah, there you are. Hey. Yeah, Jan, if you've got questions coming in, I can't actually see them. So if you've got them in, uh, go for it. Oh, okay. Sorry about that, Drew. I think Ryan could see them, but not you. Um, right. We do have one one question in the box here. Um, do you have any advice about the upcoming no-rise regulations for restoration projects when dealing with incised channels? Oh, that's a good one. Um, there are manufacturers who use no rice in their uh, products and uh, it just takes a little bit more um, fingering them out to, to find them and they may cost a little bit more, but um, they're out there. Okay, great. Um, just a comment here um, that thanks so much and learned a number of new things today and some new ways to think of these concepts so, so oh, appreciate thank you very you much for presentation you. and we do have um plenty of time here folks for questions so if you have um, additional questions go ahead and type them into the questions box or you can raise your hand and i can unmute you and um you can just ask directly and have a bit of a dialogue if that's an easier way to do it. Um, that question box is good too. Yeah, one, one question I'd like to ask, Dan, is uh, uh, how many people out there in the audience have attended one of my training sessions over time? Ah, good question. Um, by a, a show of hands here, raise your hand if you have. Um, seen Chris uh, speak before at a different um, presentation. You can just use that little raise your hand feature and I'll give folks just a second here and then I can let them know how many. 
So raise your virtual hand if you have been to a presentation by Chris before, is the question here. Looks like right now we're just getting about uh, three folks have their hands raised. So oh, yeah. um, not, not too many, a little over 10% there. Um, we do have another question just came into the box. Um, can you have a successful planting in soils with a restrictive layer within 16 to 18 inches of the surface? And would you cut off the top of the cutting? Okay. Um, yes, you can, and I have done it. Um, but it takes a real concentration on selecting the right species. Um, you have uh, you want species that have a lot of smaller hair roots. Um, shrubby species are one of those that uh, shrubby willows will send out a lot of hair roots um, right along the top of the soil. Um, and uh, even cottonwoods will actually do that. That's why you get them tipping over in windstorms is they don't go deep enough. Uh, a lot of times that has to do with watering. But um, and then you can look at um, uh, in terms of protection, sedges, um, and for those of you that have Nebraska sedge, uh, that uh, Carex nebraskensis, it has up to, oh man, it's like 22 miles of roots per cubic inch of soil. So one inch by one inch by one inch. And so when you consider that much root system in that top 16 to 18 inches, you can do a lot to protect it. And then you can add in some of those smaller shrubby willows and, and you can do a lot. Um, probably you're going to have to do something where you're going into the restrictive layer with something. It could be bigger cuttings and the idea may be that they aren't gonna grow quite as well. But a lot of times what I find is that the bottom part of it that's in the restrictive layer uh, won't grow necessarily, but as soon as it hits that 16 to 18 inches inch layer, it'll put out a whole bunch of roots. So yes, I can. Yes, you can do it, and it just takes a lot of uh, thought process. Um, and cutting off the top, um, yes, I do. Um, I mentioned I think uh, that willows in particular um, have their flowering parts in the top two feet of the cutting. And we don't want the plant to flower. We want it to grow roots and shoots and leaves, et cetera. And so um, I go through and I cut off the top two feet as much as I can possibly can. The other thing is that in that top two feet, you'll find that the diameter of the stem is really dropping dramatically. And when it goes down to way less than a half inch in diameter, uh, you're not going to get a whole lot out of it. So uh, by cutting it off, um, that also takes off the apical bud. Remember, that's the topmost bud at the, at the top of the cutting, and that causes the, the plant to grow up. And then you have the side bud, which are your branches, and those um, cause the branches to grow out. But if you cut off the top bud, then that forces all of the energy into the side buds. And part of the side buds are the roots and so you get additional energy going to the roots and then that gives you better success so that's just a little plant physiology yeah great thank you um we do have a, a hand up vanessa um if you had a question i've unmuted you so you can unmute yourself and, and ask your question hi chris my name is vanessa lee uh i just had a question about where and you know when do you often uh, offer those two to three day trainings? <laughs> Good question. That's a great question. Uh, I don't do as many of them as I used to. Um, the, uh, of course, COVID has pretty much put the kibosh on my in-person workshops. So I've been doing more webinars and we're doing several with Fish and Wildlife Service uh, that I'm going to take my um, workshops and I'm going to put 
all of the presentations on webinars. And those will be coming up um, uh, later on this fall uh, that, that are the closest I can get so far uh, to being able to uh, be in person. So uh, I, thank you for your interest and I wish I could help more, but uh, the webinars may be the, the only way I can get to it for a while yet, so. Oh, yeah, a webinar is awesome though. I mean, I, I can be in my house and learn at the same time. Yeah. Um, but so just go on to the Fish and Wildlife website and um, when, um, once you've posted and thing. Uh, yeah, the, um, um, we haven't set all of the dates yet. Um, no, go on to, uh, are you familiar with River Restoration Northwest? No, sir, I am uh, an intern, um, so I'm just trying to get as much information as I possibly can. Okay, so what you want to do is you want to Google River Restoration Northwest, and they're the ones that are going to sponsor the Fish and Wildlife Service webinars. So they'll have the complete uh, schedule and and what's going to be taught and all that kind of stuff. So that's the best I can give you right now. Sorry. No, that's fine. Thank you so much. You bet. Thank you for your question. And um, Drew, did you have a question you wanted to to ask? I see something in the chat here, but yeah, Chris, um, I'm uh, curious about uh, the willow clumps that you mentioned. Um, I've never used any of those, and I was wondering if you could maybe just talk a little bit more about those and like how how they're used or how they're even uh, how you're how you're how they're used and how you're installing them. And then my second part of that question is. Um, could they be used similar to like a root wad in a bank project? And have you ever used like a willow root wad as opposed to like a conifer that someone might put in? Yes, to all of those. Um, so the clumps, there is a tech note that I have written that explains it in, in a lot of detail. Uh, basically what you're talking about doing is, is you would go into the floodplain and you would dig up small young clumps with roots and everything and um, then you would either truck over to the side of the bank and uh, put it in a pre-dug hole or you can put those on a trailer and stack them on the trailer cover them with the tarp and then truck them to the site and then have the backhoe pull them off of the trailer and put them in the hole um, you want to use young sort of you know six eight feet tall and not really old uh willows because it's a it's pretty stressful on them and so the younger ones don't have as much root system out in the ground and so what i do is i don't want a you know four yard bucket on the on the uh backhoe either i want to just a, a either a one or two uh, yard bucket and and then um I will uh, have him go over and you want to, instead of going over the top of it like this and down and lifting it out, you come in from the side so you don't break the tops off. You come in from the side, you sort of lay those off to the side and then you dig down. You don't have to go to China to get the roots, you just go to the depth of the bucket and then you uh, bring that up and then uh, generally I'll, uh, if it's close enough, truck it right back over and and put it in the ground. Um, again, remember I, in one of the slides I said one quarter of the root mass needs to be in the lowest water table of the year and then three quarters can be above that. Um, generally what I'll do is is I'll give it a, a, a mohawk, well a scalp. Uh, once I've planted it and uh, the in order to get to the water, you may have to go down deeper than the root mass. If the root mass is this far, but the but the water table is down, you know, another three feet or something like that, what you have to do is put the root mass all the way down into the bottom, and then the stems that are up going up the top, and then um, 
sticking out of the ground, then you fill it in. And all the stems that are being filled in uh, with soil, packed around the soil, will actually start rooting. And they'll root out and, and give you a lot more root mass uh, over time. And then the amount of cutting that's sticking out of the ground, generally I'd like to have about three feet. Um, and so it just depends on how deep your water is uh, as to whether you can get tall enough clumps to harvest. And then what I do is I'll, I'll just take a lopper or a, you know, a hedge trimmer and, and just cut it straight off at three feet. And that way you have a ground, above ground biomass. If you have a high flow that comes across, it'll intercept it slow it down, reduce the erosion, allow sedimentation to occur around the, around the plant. Um, and that's a, that's a good way. You have to look at um, sometimes permits uh, are necessary and uh, you have to talk uh, to your permitting agency in order to make sure they're okay with that. Uh, if you have a good source of willows, usually it's not a big problem. Um, We've also gone to the point now where we are growing, quote, growing our own clumps, where we're taking large uh, pots and we're putting in multiple cuttings into soil in those pots, growing those out, and then just taking those over and putting them in the hole like you would a clump. And that way you get by the, the permitting problems. And so uh, that's a cool way to do it and it works really well. You know, uh, you're you're looking at probably 10 gallon, 15 gallon pots, maybe even bigger, uh, to get those. Uh, and again, you want to make sure that the length of the cutting is right for the site that you're going to go to and the depth of the water. So, I is that everything, Drew? That you I can't remember if there was something else. Yeah, that was great. Um... I'm definitely gonna check out that tech note. Um, I guess the other half of my question was regarding um, using them like a root wad, like you would a con oh. someone use a conifer, or like a yeah. tree used as a root wad, but using uh, willows. Yeah, and we actually did that um, in Wyoming, and and uh, we dug it up, and then we dug into the bank, and then we just took the clump in the bucket. And she actually put it down in the water and then slid it into the bank. And then we planted a second one right on top of it sticking up. So the first one is sticking out like the root rod and the top one is sticking up for protection. And uh, that were pretty cool. I have not tried it with tree type willows, you know, sticking them out there. I, you could do it, but it's not gonna do the same. I would use more something like a uh, gyre willow or um, something like that that has a big, uh, uh, large stems. Uh, let's see, how do I say that? Um, a, a large bunch of stems um, that are, you know, a couple inches in diameter, inch to two, three inches in diameter. These would be the older ones, of course, and just sticking those in. And then the other thing that we were testing was how much of the branch to cut off. And remember that you don't want to have more than one third of the channel, channel impacted by whatever you're putting in. So when you figure out what that one third is, then every all you just cut off the branches uh, at that one third of channel width. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, Chris. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions in the question box or or hands up. Um, and we are um, getting close to lunchtime here. If anybody has any um, last thoughts, Wait, I do have one new new comment here. Um, I had learned at one point to put two thirds of the stake in the ground to help with success of the plant and to make enough in the soil for root growth. Now I'm thinking more about what you said about making sure it gets into the water zone. Does this still hold true or do I need to sort of relearn this thought? No, that is a good rule of thumb. Two thirds in the ground, one third above the ground is always a good, it's a good rule of thumb. Um, but you have to temper that rule of thumb with depth 
to the lowest water table of the year. And if it's deeper than two thirds, then you're gonna have to put more in. Uh, if it's shallower, generally what I'll do, let's just say for example, it's three feet uh, long and generally I'll put two feet in the ground. Let's say the water table is up to within a foot of the surface. I still put the two foot in, even though that bottom part is more than a foot into the water table. So um, it's just a, a good way to think about it in terms of you want to make sure that you have one foot above to give you enough uh, surface area for stems and leaves, but you want to make sure that you have more than two thirds in the ground to give you enough roots to give you that sprouting of leaves and give you allow to survive. So uh, you learned it right. You just need to maybe expand upon it a little bit for each situation.